All right, everybody, I would like to welcome today to the e-commerce masters podcast, uh, Ravi Karani, uh, president and founder, or founder and president, I guess, of, of Sutro. Uh, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome. It's awesome. I was really looking forward to, to, to talking to you uh, as I've as I've done all the research uh, for the episode. Um, now I'm, my feed is all swimming pools, which is, you know, something that I've, that I've wanted to have for a long time. And so, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your product Sutro and, um, uh, how, you know, how you created it and what your target target market is. Yeah. So our kind of 50,000 foot view is basically a robotics platform. Um, what we've built is a robotic water diagnostics device that measures basically if your water is clean or if it's safe, right? So for your swimming pool, it'll just float in your swimming pool or hot tub or jacuzzi. Um, and it measures your pH, your free chlorine, your bromine and your alkalinity and temperature. Um, and it shoots everything to an iOS or Android app that tells you exactly what to do and when to do it if your chemistry is off. Um, and so it's a pretty, pretty simple, simple pitch. There's not really too much complexity there. The real complexity is when you actually look at how the unit actually measures the water chemistry and that's where a lot of our intellectual property and kind of fancy engineering is. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, how did, what, 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 like who is the target market for your product? Is it anybody with a swimming pool? Yeah, actually it is. It's, it's your, your regular homeowner living in, you know, California, Texas, Arizona, uh, wherever it's hot. And also in the, you know, Northeastern States. Yeah. Um, if you have a swimming pool, if you have a swimming pool, a hot tub in your backyard, um, you are our customer. We are also breaking into the commercial market. So the YMCA's, the Hyatt's, the Hilton's, um, the Lagio Hotel, right? We want to get to all those as well. Um, but we're currently not there yet because you need um, an NSF certification to actually unlock that. But um, definitely on our roadmap. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So by using your product, you're kind of getting rid of the like the shake, the uh, you know the, the the tester shake that you, you you fill up and you put the drops in and and and, and it kind of gives you all that and, and more i assume in terms of of diagnostics about that right yeah exactly and so that's kind of one part of the problem right taking the water putting those little drops inside there shaking it up you're like you know ask your wife or husband hey is that is that a dark red or a light red right nobody <laughs> really knows what color it is they're like well i think it's an 8.2 i think it's a 7.8 so that's kind of the first problem is actually figuring out what the water chemistry is. And then the harder part is actually figuring out what you're supposed to do, right? So let's assume that right. you say the color is a dark red and it's a, you know, 8.2 pH. Now you need to pull out your little booklet. They have these little booklets in the test kit, right? You have to scroll down. You're like, I have 20,000 gallons and it's an 8.2. So I have, you're doing all this math. And so everything basically gets calculated there. And there's a simple what to do on the application because it's pre-calculated yeah. in how many gallons you have, what the weather is, yep. um, all of that stuff. Oh, that's so cool. Like, can I just share one of my guilty pleasures with you? There's yeah, this sure. guy on, on Instagram and TikTok, the pool guy, I think he's out of the UK, and he goes and does the dirtiest pools. And, you know, and um, like that to me, I don't know why it is so <laughs> interesting to me to see how bad these pools are. And then they clean them up miraculously and get the chemicals right and the pH right and they vacuum them and do and do all the things. And so, you know, I, I have always wanted to have a swimming pool, but my wife says it's, you know, uh, she had one earlier in her life and she's like, it's, it's just such a pain in the butt to, to, to maintain, to do the testing, to keep the chemicals right. You know, it's just like there's too much to kind of figure out with that. And so... I think it's just such an ingenious thing to be able to have to, to test the water. And so it just floats in, in the pool and gives you gives you readouts on, on what to do. It really kind of makes it a lot more idiot proof. It just it just seems like I hate to talk about it in that way. But, um, you know, people that have pools that I know as well, they talk about how much of a pain it is to keep the chemicals and to keep it. Clear yeah, I'm, and, I'm and, almost and, wondering if if I can send you a little demo unit or something, you can show that to your wife and say, Hey, look, you know, I, I think we can get a pool now because this will, this will make our life easier. <laughs> yeah. You're going to send me your free, your, the, a free demo and make me spend a hundred K to get a, get a, yeah, get right? a, swim, you know, a swimming pool. That's great. That's great. No, but it really is, I think a, a super cool product and it's something that, um, 
you know, quite frankly, like, uh, like I don't know why more, like, more people don't have these, right? Like, and so in, in terms of, uh, you know, why not keep track of that, right? Like, you know, be able to put all of your, um, to put all of your information into the app and to get like specifics of like what to adjust because I, I feel like it's the kind of thing people often, uh, they don't treat it like baking where they're kind of doing mm. like, like, like um, exact measurements, right? They're just kind of like pouring things in at, at times, right? And so, uh, you know, I would bet like there's always something out of whack unless you really like, like are able to track it like with the diagnostic tool. How did, how did you create the product? Yeah, kind of two tangential stories. So the first is I actually grew up as a pool boy. My okay. dad used to have a chain of pool and spa supply stores in, in Southern California. Um, and so I've done everything from, you know, a lot of that, what that pool guy does, right? You, you clean dirty right. pools, you install pumps. Um, I used to run my own pool store and went on to go and get an engineering degree and actually worked in venture capital in India. And the second part of the story is working in this VC fund, we got a lot of water related deals on our table, right? Water is a big mm -hmm. problem in India. And a lot of the deals that we saw were around water filtration, but nobody was actually focusing on water sensing. And you kind of have to know what's wrong with the water before you fix the water. And so I started looking at the sensing market and we saw that either there's these test strips that are prone with error, right back to the dark red versus right light red. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mind you, water is the largest killer in the, in the world, right? Diarrhea and dysentery through water as a vector is, yeah. is one of the largest killers. And the other side of the spectrum had these really expensive 10, 20, $30,000 devices that obviously somebody earning less than $2 a day couldn't afford. Um, and so we basically set out to figure out how can we build a diagnostic sensor that has the accuracy of those really expensive sensors, but has the kind of, you know, like you said, the kind of idiot factor to be able to get information to the user so they can actually act upon it. Um, and that's where we first came up with Sutro. Uh, I tried selling it to the Indian government and probably the stupidest thing a startup can do. They're riddled <laughs> with red tape and it just, we would have probably yeah. died on the vine while we tried pitching them. And so I uh, put my pool boy shorts back on and flipped the entire model around. And we said, why don't we sell to wealthy pool owners, sell it at a margin, at a higher margin, and use that money to basically redeploy into the product so we can then go into these more altruistic markets later, like food and beverage, like drinking water, um, the more industrial markets. And so uh, that's kind of what set us off back in 2015. That's pretty cool. That's a neat journey. I mean, and, and um, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's just, and I, and I don't mean idiot proof like in that way, but it's like people want to be told what to do right they yeah. want to, like hey what am i supposed to do here right and 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 i think it's um you know whether it's for drinking water or whether it's for pool water i think that there is a um you know a common desire to like you know hey how do i how do i deal with this um kind of thing and so um you know people go away on vacation and they come back and you know go away for two weeks and they come back and their pool's green already and so you know i think that there's um uh, being able to keep that in check and, and to be able to understand, hey, what exactly do I need to do here to move, to get back to using the pool um, is great. What's the, so what's the price, what's your current price point on the product? We sell the product for $4.99 uh, for the actual robot that floats in your swimming pool. Um, and then monthly, there is a cartridge that's actually filled with the exact same chemicals that you use when you test your water with that, you know, shaking test kit. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, if you remember that, that, that red chemical, mm -hmm. the phenol red measures pH, the, you know, the, the, the two yellow ones measure chlorine DPD. We take exactly those chemicals from the reagent supplier that actually sell you those reagents. Um, and we put them inside of our cartridge. We have two plans. That's a 29 or a $39 plan, uh, basic or premium. And those kick off as soon as you buy the device for as long as you're using the pool. So for those folks that are in, you know, the winter, um, where it starts to snow and they close down their pool, they can start and stop the Sutro right. subscription. Um, so we don't make you pay for it when you're obviously not using it. Right. Oh, cool. Does it, is a, is, does the size of the pool affect, uh, you know, affect like the, the, how quickly you go through the cartridges or is it just kind of a, um, a general, like, uh, you know, a one size fits all, 
uh, for folks, whether they want to go with something more basic or more advanced in terms of the diagnostics? Yeah, it's, it's more of a kind of diagnostics and, and data uh, play that we have on the basic versus premium. The robot itself doesn't change, neither does the cartridge. Um, kind of very similar that the proxy is your test kit, right? You don't buy a bigger test kit or a smaller test kit if you have a larger body, you know, smaller body of water. Um, the same test kit works because you're circulating the water. So that, that molecule that's in the pump will eventually make its way into the, into the actual pool and vice versa. Um, so that's why you don't really have to worry about getting different robots. It's actually the app and the data that's going to be a little bit different between basic and premium. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Um, how do you, I know you have a Shopify store. How are you currently selling your product? Are you, you know, available through retail channels? Is it all direct to consumer? What's kind of the, the general journey to find you? Yeah, we're about 95% direct to consumer um, through our online channel, through the Shopify store. Um, primarily use, you know, your typical uh, paid marketing channels like Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're creeping in with a little bit more TikTok and we also have an Amazon store as well. Um, we are looking at actually getting into distribution and retail uh, this year and, and, and beginning in the next year. We're actually in the midst of working on a web-based product that lives at the pool store, right? So if you're familiar with this behavior, people will take the sample of their pool water to a Leslie's pool supply or you know mm -hmm. your neighborhood, your neighborhood mom and pop pool shop. Um, and so what will be sitting there in the future, right? What we're building is this web software that you can give them that bottle of water. They'll test your full parameters and that basically gets paired with your sutra reading that's floating inside your swimming pool. So now you kind of get full visibility of your limited parameters. That's kind of your heartbeat of the sutra that's floating in your pool, monitoring your water chemistry. And then you can get the kind of full checkup when you go into a pool store using our software. Um, the reason I say that software is because that's actually helping us get into retail um, to both get eyes on top of the software as well as actually sell the Sutra device as well. Um, and so that's kind of what we're working on in 2024, 25. That's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, it's, a, it, you know, I think that that's a really neat strategy of kind of have, you know, have both both channels working for you in terms of, uh, um, you know, something even more advanced at the at the retail level. Um, I know you have your Shopify store. Um, you know, who are some of the other? What are some of the other tools? Do you like do you like Clavio that you might be leveraging within within the store? Yeah, we definitely use Clavio uh, um, as far as our um, obviously email software. We have a we've been trying a few different referral softwares. I don't think we really settled on one yet, but um, we might actually end up building up our our own in house. Um, we use. Uh, recharge for subscriptions. Mm -hmm. um, although I know with Shopify and Recharge, there's a little bit of change that we need to do. And we've we've done a pretty deep custom integration with Recharge, and that's kind of coming to bite us now, actually, because with the new um, Shopify subscription stuff. So we have to kind of mm -hmm. dig that all up and basically rebuild it. Um, and yeah, those are those are kind of the the major plugins that we have on Shopify. What is uh you know what does your team look like that like, you know, who do you have working on Shopify? Who's kind of driving all of your online marketing efforts? Yeah, our CMO is uh, Sarah, Sarah Sheed. And um, she's absolutely amazing. She kind of um, subcontracts out a few different things with the Facebook and, you know, digital side. We have folks that are working on SEO and blog writing. Um, and then obviously on creatives and, and ads as well, as well as influencer management. Um, but yeah, Sarah, Sarah is kind of top there and she... She and I work really closely on kind of making sure that we're, one, looking at actually what's happening new in the market and always pivoting, um, but secondarily kind of keeping that keeping that workhorse running with the uh, with the existing SEO, SEM, and creatives team that we have. How does how does your Amazon strategy layer in with that? Is that um, is that a primary driver? You know, I, I talk to folks, and some of them they're their own website is their primary business driver and others like Amazon is a, is a, is a bigger driver at, at, at times for them. Like how are you seeing those channels kind of work? Yeah, Amazon. Um, and we do for, um, FBA with Amazon. Mm -hmm. So we do, you know, participate in prime and not just, um, fulfill from our own warehouse. Um, it would comprise of about 25% or so of our total okay. units sold, give or take. 
Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a healthy channel, but it's not the only channel. Yeah. Um, a lot of our, you know, sales obviously still do go straight through our Shopify store. And those, um, those are those direct, you, you mentioned warehouse. So are those direct fulfilled or are you doing FBA for, uh, for every, everything? No, the ones on Shopify are direct fulfilled. We do fulfill those. Um, okay. FBA is only for the, for the, for the Amazon sales. Yeah. All right. All right. Any other big channels that, that work, that are working for you currently eBay or any other marketplaces that, um, you know, I, I really wanted Walmart to work and I still have like in the back of my, we, we stepped up this Walmart store and like it just, for some reason we set everything up. We even got like a consultant on board to figure out how to get it to work, um, or how to figure, you know, how to get more momentum on it. We made like one sale. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of have, I don't know it, I have this real, this kind of itch that I, I, I feel like Walmart's going to work, but for some reason it's just, it, it hasn't picked up. That's fair. It's a Walmart's a very interesting marketplace and channel, right? And and, and um, um, you know, it's uh, in, in some ways your product might be, as you mentioned, kind of your target market of pool owners that that might be above, you know, uh, Walmart in some ways in terms of where their focus is. But it's kind of a little all over the place in terms of what can be successful there. Yeah, um, and I, you know, I I would kind of add to in terms of distribution, we are also looking at like OEMs as well. Right, so people that sell you the the equipment for your swimming pool, or something like that, we can um, pair and partner with them so that they can actually bundle a sutro. Uh, we're working on a on a unit that goes in pipe, so it's not floating, um, which would be valuable for those folks that sell pumps and filters. Um, and then the second is actually big box retailers, right? So looking at Home Depot, um, Lowe's, they have huge home and garden centers, and so trying to figure out how to also kind of um, get into the home improvement world as well, because we, we kind of directly parlay with that target market. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, those, those seem to me like they could be interesting channels for, for growth, especially, you know, big box, like, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Best Buy, you know, like there's often even myself personally, I'll, I'll see an, an item online and, um, uh, look for it and it'll be available at my local Best Buy. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to go over and pick it up now. Um, yeah. you know, it's 10 minutes away. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity with that. I also think in, uh, uh, you know, a solution that's kind of in line in the pipe, like that would be very interesting, you know, as, as well too, right. It just, um, becomes just a part of your, your pool's DNA, so to speak. Um, you know, yeah. And, and, the and the floating is really good from a, from a deployment standpoint, right. It's very easy to install because you drop the thing in. Um, but I think people, when they're in their pools, obviously don't, you know, want something floating around as well. And so I think it really does open up an entire opportunity around the in pipe in line version as well. Totally. How, I mean, it, you know, I'm always intrigued by people that, that, that create things, especially devices, right? I mean, to me, like IOT devices are like, like, it's like, how do you get from idea and concept to a completed product? How long did that take you to kind of get from, hey, I want to start testing water to, hey, I've got the prototype of this device that can uh, float in a pool and kind of give me all these diagnostics? A, a ton of blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, it's like, it's it's absolutely, you know, they, they don't say hardware's hard for kind of no reason. Um, <laughs> you're, you, you see software companies getting funded, and not only do we have to make a solid piece of software that people can interface with, but there's this entire world of, you know, hardware. Um, so to kind of answer your question, we started off in 2014 and we had our first working prototypes by 2016 or so. I mean, we, we had working concepts very quickly after we had started the company, obviously, you know, we had the patents and we knew that right. the technology worked. It was just a matter of actually getting it deployed. Um, as I sold the company to, to uh, Sandy Mark up in Canada, um, is when we really started putting kind of pen to paper and I spent, you know, probably 30% of my time over the course of the next two years between 2018 and 2020 um, on making sure that the product was, you know, working, we had the right molds made. Cause I mean, once you, once you make this aluminum mold, you're starting to pump plastic. Right. And that's like, you, you, you can't change a line of code on a hard aluminum mold. And so, that's you just kind of have to dot all your i's cross all your t's you have to make sure that none of the water seeps inside there you know you have electronics floating in the pool 
Um, so a lot of things to worry about, but uh, two years is kind of, I guess, the answer to your question of how long did it take before we went to China, started hitting the manufacturing line, and I would say about a year and a half of R&D and development um, just in the lab. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, you, you know, it's, did you have any issues during, uh, you know, and, and I'm, you know, probably trying to get under the under the skirt a little bit in terms of did you have any like major issues or problems during the during that kind of R and D process or manufacture early manufacturing process that caused you to kind of step back and retool? Um, you know, just kind of the mold aspect of things is what you know it really is like. Like you mentioned, it's like once you kind of get in like start going from mold, you're like are kind of you can't do it. You've got to keep going with what you have. Um, yeah, it is kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of envisioning Maslow's hierarchy, right? You're you're at the, you're you're at the bottom, and there's the things that you just have to get right, and you can't touch once you've stamped them, and that, what falls underneath that is obviously, the initial design, right? You want to make sure that because that's what you're going to market with, um, so industrial design is number one on that Maslow's hierarchy, um, number two on that bottom rung is plastics, right? When you're making those molds, you have to make sure that they're stamped inside there. Once those are kind of done, you can move up one layer and I would say electronics kind of fall inside there, right? PCBAs, the actual boards, the electronics boards that we make. Those are a little bit easier to kind of edit and change, but closer to the bottom because once you actually make them, you have to get them certified. Um, and in particular, once the FCC certifies them, you, you can't change them. You kind of, you know, that, that, that train's running. Right. Um, the kind of third chain above the plastics and the electronics is actually the software that lives on the boards, right? We call that firmware. Um, firmware is easier to change. You know, you can, you can plug something in just like you do your Apple updates on your iPhones. That's basically what you're doing sometimes um, is kind of firmware updates. And those are easier to change, but if you change them in the wrong way, you can also brick a bunch of devices, right? If you if you right. like change something that doesn't work, you'll be able to interact with it. And then kind of fourth on the hierarchy list is just software. Um, that's overall easy to update, right? Those things move really quickly. Once you get the right. bottom three correct, I can push app updates, you know, daily if I feel like it. Probably right. not the smartest right. thing, but you can you can change code with a much less risk than anywhere up and down that um, that kind of Maslow's or hardware hardware hierarchy, let's call it that. Um, that's kind of the way I would I would define it. And those are the kind of I's and T's you need to cross off in that in that order. Are you continuing to refactor and upgrade the firmware, or is that something that's kind of been pretty shelf stable for you? It's slower moving than the software, but we do change it, and I think it probably changes at a frequency of once every you know uh, four to six months, give or take. Um, one, from just a risk perspective, we don't want to change firmware that quickly. And secondarily, the board is kind of what the board is, right? We have levers and things that we can change to make the battery life more efficient or to, you know, squeeze out more data from the device. But um, overall, our, our, our V1 kind of 80% of it still lives even in future DNA versions of uh, of, the, of the firmware. All right. All right. What do you... Um... How do you spend your time in terms of uh, being president of the business? Like, are you focused on product? Are you focused on driving, uh, you know, new channels? Like, where are you kind of, how are you focusing your time? And all of the above and kind of, you know, everything in the kitchen sink is also an appropriate answer here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, actually, because I think... I've gone through multiple phases, right? In building and being a founder that's first raising venture dollars, I felt like everything in the kitchen sink was definitely uh, in my job description. You know, everything from literally cleaning bathrooms to like making sure that the office was vacuumed because we had investors coming, um, all the way to kind of filing the patents, right? And working with our patent attorneys and filing corporate documents. Um, once we sold the company, a lot of that let's say admin overhead was kind of um, outsourced, right? In a certain sense to yeah. our parent company. Yeah. Um, so everything from payroll to accounting to kind of HR, a lot of that stuff was gone and I could kind of focus on deploying and building product, right? Which also was my objective when we first sold the company. Now I would call that kind of, you know, version three or phase three of Robbie is a bit of 
bit of kind of like a kind of like a barbell. Um, on one end of the barbell is really really heavy, getting in the weeds of problems that are still not solved yet in the organization. Right, I think we've hired an amazing team that solves kind of everything that we had problems with, but there's always things that pop up. And so whenever there's kind of a helping hand that's needed, I always jump in on that side. And then the other part of the, the other side of the barbell or the dumbbell would be, like you said, thinking of kind of what the future holds, right? What are we going to do in the next two years, the next five years, um, working with our parent company's management to figure out if there's any other places we can integrate, right? They sell water sanitation chemicals into multiple different industries. Um, we've built a platform for the swimming pool industry, but is there a way of scaling that into other industries? Um, we have this amazing tool chest of hardware development, sensor development, you know, R and D engineers, software engineers, how do we kind of mold and manipulate what we've built to make sure that it's more applicable for what they're working on? Um, and so that's kind of the, uh, second half of kind of what I work on as well. All right. All right. So speaking of kind of integrations, do you in, does your software integrate with any home automation platforms like Home Assistant or Alexa or um, Smart Things or anything like that to kind of pull that data into other systems? Not yet, but it is on our roadmap. Um, we're targeting it by the end of this year to actually launch a public API. Um, so one, people can actually build um, into their own automation systems. And then secondarily, with that open API, we'll actually digest that API, API ourselves and actually make the Home Assistant, um, Google Home, and Alexa skills yeah. because those are obviously the three largest platforms that are out there. Yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, I, I have, uh, you know, my, uh, much to the dismay of my wife, I have all of our house kind of automated and, and connected in and, and, you know, everything from our light switches to our garage door opener to our um, sprinkler system. And so, you know, that's an interesting piece, like, for me of being able to get alerts or, um, you know, have those systems kind of interconnected in a way that I can look at it from one place and um, kind of be notified when when I need to do something, um, you know, and and report on that. So um, I'm always personally looking for products that integrate with with those types of systems just because it uh, I like seeing it all all together, you know. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that. definitely. And I think with even more let's call them accessible interfaces, right? With even like Meta's, um, like the Meta Ray-Ban glasses uh, with with voice becoming more prevalent, you know, even things like large language models like ChatGPT and, and, and Anthropic, I think we're gonna be massaging and interfacing with data a lot differently than just, you know, a four by two screen that you have in your hand. Right. Um, and so trying to keep that atop of, you know, in, in the top of our minds as well, of how do we design for the next interfaces that we're gonna be working with um, and how do you manipulate data to make sure that you're still getting the information you need is also kind of a concern of ours as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cause um, you know, I can imagine, um, you know, like a you know, use case where somebody uh, you know, may not log into the app and kind of look at it like regularly or, or, Hey, I want to be notified and um, I want to have that in a place. Like for example, I get notified if my freezer, my garage freezer like loses power. Um, while I'm on vacation or something like that, right? Just to being able to, um, like, to, to have that connected. I was in a doctor's office today, and uh, instead of having the little bell to ring for service at the front desk, they actually had an Alexa sit there, and it was like, mm. if no one's here, ask Alexa uh, to to <laughs> ring the bell, and you know, it rang a it rang a rang a bell throughout the business. So it's it's you know, it's always intriguing to me how people are evolving their products and figure out how. How to connect them together? Um, what you know? What do you think your biggest challenge, current challenge to growth is for the company? I would say it's keeping CAC down, right? the The biggest issue that we have right now is just making sure that we're making the P and L even. Um, you know, as as a startup, one of the metrics is just aggressive, aggressive growth. Um, at kind of all, you know, at, at, at no cost. I think that's also changing in the venture model now, but um, being owned by, by another parent company, uh, the P&L statement is obviously very important, right? Making sure that we're profitable and focusing on profit is of the utmost concern. And so around growth, it's making sure that we're doing it profitably. And I think a lot of those other distribution channels come directly into play by answering that question. Um, and so... Yeah, that, that's, I would say that's kind of like the biggest thing that we're having right now. That's cool. 
Um, what's keeping you up at night currently? Um, literally is probably signing these, the, the, these like large contracts that have, you know, really, really long sales cycles. Um, it's easy to plop up a Shopify store and spend, you know, X amount of dollars on ads and start to see some momentum, but you know, pitching for development dollars, making sure that we're doing these integrations properly with these OEM companies, um, that takes time and it takes a lot of, you know, legalese. It takes a lot of pouring through documents to make sure that we're protected from a liability and security standpoint. And so, uh, that's kind of the biggest thing that keeps me up at night is like making sure that we're doing the distribution side of it properly to make sure that we can reap those rewards, um, on lessening our customer acquisition costs in the future. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, yeah, that's, that's the challenge, right? How do you get enough, how do you get enough volume? Right. And so, you know, I was very curious about, um, you know, sometimes people sell the hardware as a lost leader to get the subscriptions. Like, some, you know, there's all these different types of, 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 of ways that people focus and create valuation around, you know, around these products. And so, um, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, but your product is like very advanced, right? I mean, like you have to have a very solid product to live in water. Like water is like kills everything. So especially exactly. like electronics. Yeah. yeah. And especially chlorine um, water, right? That like kills chlorine. things really quickly. Yes. Everything kills everything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Well, you know, I have I've, anything else that you'd like to add um, about Sutro or, or your, what you're, what you're creating there. Um, no, just if you any of your listeners, any of the listeners out there have a swimming pool, go to my um, and grab one this summer before it, before it starts to cool down again. <laughs> yes. We need to get you, uh, we need to get you this guy, my pool guy out of the UK. You need to get, uh, you need to get in his, in his social feed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's it's amazing to see how many followers and commenters he has about every every pool um, he he posts. Um, if you had one piece of advice, I always like to ask folks if you had one piece of advice for another founder, uh, what would what would you what would you say to them? I'd say perfection is the enemy of progress. Um, just hit the just hit the publish button when you feel like you're embarrassed because if you don't, then you're going to be a little too late. That's great advice. That is great advice. Uh, I, I say that to myself all the time. I'm a Virgo, so I try to be a perfectionist with everything. So, <laughs> Well, it's great to have you on the show. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you sharing uh, information um, about Sutro. Um, very unique product. I think it's very cool, and, and uh, I wish you much continued success with that. And so thank you very much as well for taking time out of your busy day to spend with us and our listeners and, and, and tell them about what you're doing. Yeah, of course. Anytime. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you.